Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. July 24th, 2020. Minutes to go to the cash close here on a Friday afternoon of a fairly wild week. We're going to go into all the detail surrounding markets here momentarily. It's kind of no surprise where the markets are ending up uh, on this Friday afternoon. <laughs> We're just a hop, skip, and a jump away from our... Uh, 3211 gravity point obviously the nasdaq taking a little bit of heat later here in the week but before we even start to really discuss markets before we actually start to break down a little bit about volatility or bonds push all of it aside for a moment it's a bubble people you're gonna have to look no further than retail trade you know i had a little bit of time throughout the course of this week and I really started exploring in depth because I've been hearing all of these things about you know Robin Hood and all of the Robin Hood traders and they're moving the markets so <laughs> here it is I took the time to explore brokerage firms outside of Robin Hood we're, we're not even going to include that because the order flow that's in Robin Hood is nominal small i mean there's still again the average account size there it's minimal in comparison to some of the big boys on the street you know and again we're just going to focus on some of the retail okay applications right the td ameritrades the charles schwab the e-trades okay interactive brokers and i'm actually going to show you their numbers and you're going to see something that is uh well enlightening possibly startling because I'm telling you right now, it is a bubble, people. It is a retail trading bubble that we are in right now. And there is absolutely unequivocally no question, okay, that trading right now is completely in the hands of the retail world. Let's take you into it. What I'm going to start with here are individual metrics Okay, from some public firms. I'm going to start with E-Trade. I'm going to show you exactly what this is the first time through. And again, I'm telling you, these numbers are critical. I personally spent okay, 15 years inside of the brokerage world. I am intimately familiar with darts, both derivative and non-derivative. I'll explain all of that. But uh, let's get to work in some of the explanations to kind of uh, begin with here. When I say let's get to work on this and a uh, little bit of explanation, I think there is some explanation kind of necessary here. So what you're looking at is taken directly from the uh, E-Trade Investor Relations site. And what I want you to focus on first right here happens to be June. So the June metrics just came out. Darts, what does it stand for? Daily Avenue Revenue Trades. For the most part, right now, E-Trade, E-Traders. They're doing about 1.1 million trades a day. And you're like... Oh, whatever, man. I want you to see something, okay? Because there's a reason that I put in metrics from like November. Listen, this is kind of where trading started to go for like free, free trading, free trades. And what I wanted you to see is no one cares about free trades. It's all about volatility. It is on, baby. Volatility is on. When I say nobody cares about free trades, it's it's simply, it's in the darts here, especially, by the way, E-Trade. I wanted to start with them because they're one of the few that actually break up how many, like, you know, stock trades versus derivative trades. Derivatives can include options and predominantly futures contracts. Those are the only derivatives that E-Trade even offers. So when you look at the uh, derivatives, I wanted you to see this because the derivatives, they didn't necessarily go free. And look at the growth of derivatives here and even the percentage okay, of trades. Yeah, people are trading a lot of stock, but the bottom line is okay, even the growth of derivative trades, almost a 300,000 okay, derivative darts a day. And you're like, oh, whatever. Listen, here's the bottom line right now. Okay, we've jumped what? Oh, we're at three and a half, you know, we're sorry, 350,000 trades a day. And uh, here we are at 1.1 million. You're like, okay, so it's so it's just E-Trade. So they're doing right now, let's just accumulate everything. It's about 1.1 million okay, trades a day are actually going through E-Trade's pipes, 25% of which are derivatives now not every brokerage firm breaks down derivatives they like to keep that a little bit more secretive of course i was in the brokerage world for 15 years you know who has the derivative trades and who doesn't next on the docket so by the way 
looking this up, and again, all the time I've spent in the brokerage business, I was dumbfounded when I actually saw E-Trade crack over a million darts, okay? Again, they're doing 1.1 million trades a day. It's E-Trade. And I say that not, not to be disparaging at all. I didn't expect that kind of size, okay? I just, you know, I, I keep up on the darts, but only like once or twice a year do I look at this stuff when I saw their numbers. And again, one of my close friends runs part of E-Trade and I had no idea they were doing this kind of size. Like, where have I been? I just haven't looked at their metrics. Again, I worked at, you know, TD Ameritrade before that thinkorswim and, you know, 15 years in the brokerage business. I knew what our darts were. These numbers, though, are just downright staggering, but it gets better. Okay. Then we come over here to Charles Schwab. Chuck, so better known as Chucky. Now, Charles Schwab, of course, is in the middle of purchasing TD Ameritrade, neither here nor there. What I wanted to show you with Charles Schwab, okay, I only have, uh, again, a couple of weeks in here. Charles Schwab, interestingly enough, breaks down, okay, their daily avenue revenue trades into, okay, they, by the way, they don't use the, uh, you know, the daily, uh, you know, average trades. They don't, they don't use the word revenue. Anyway, uh, Chucky here is good for about 1.4 million trades in a day. That one also kind of shocked me because uh, I know exactly what their size has been over the years and it's been absolutely nowhere near that. So uh, Charles Schwab is good for uh, 1.4. Now, Charles Schwab though, is gonna be predominantly just stock trades. There's not nearly the number of derivatives. Uh, I'll just take a shot. They're probably between eight and 10% in the derivative side of the business. Moving along over here. Then we come to interactive brokers. Interactive brokers, there's no questions. These guys are rocking rocking when it comes to derivative trades okay there's i mean listen most of the time a firm like this is is going to be half or beyond half in terms of derivative trades but look at the growth here okay so they're at a million trades a day again a day back here in january and everybody knows like interactive broker is kind of the place for like pseudo professionals to go they're really low on commissions um they're up to about 1.8 1.9 okay 1.85 in here i'll just round it in this case we got 1.8 in terms of uh, interactive brokers, which uh, this one, this one didn't surprise me uh, at all. Uh, people trade and trade heavily. They go to interactive brokers, but even even interactive brokers, just from January to uh, to June right now, you're six months into the year, they've almost doubled the size. Okay, so they've almost doubled the size. Yeah, we're getting somewhere. Here comes the big one, people. Here here comes the big one. It's TD Ameritrade. Now, when it comes to breaking down, you know, the trades of TD Ameritrade, I can tell you everything about it. Uh, however, I have been out of TD Ameritrade since 2015. Back when I was there in 2015, we were doing between uh, 400, 450,000 darts uh, a day. Yeah, their metrics just came out. People, they're good for 3.9 million trades a day. Where's Robin Hood in this? <laughs> Please. Okay, it's not even part of the discussion right now. And it can't be part of the discussion. These people are doing 3.9 million trades a day. It is staggering numbers. And you're going to see why here in just a second. So, darts, add them up. E-Trade's good for 1.1 million. Chucky's good for 1.4. Interactive Brokers, I rounded it down to 1.8. Okay, TD Ameritrade, uh, it's a cool 3.8, 3.9. Add it up. It's 8.1 million darts. Now, what does this not include? Okay, it doesn't include some of the peripheral brokerage firms. Why? Well, if you're not public, you don't necessarily have to come out there with some of your darts. But um, Robinhood is uh, obviously trades a lot of stock. They're starting to get bigger in options. Tastyworks, Tastyworks. <laughs> oh my gosh, Tastyworks is like almost all option trades out there. Uh, it doesn't include, you know, firms like Tradier. Tradier does some uh, does some size. And there's a bunch of other, like, real smaller firms that we're not even necessarily including. And I apologize if you're in the brokerage business and I omitted you. That's because uh, you didn't stand up to the uh, 3.8 million dart test over here. So where am I going with this and why do I call it a bubble? Well, I'm going to show you. Remember, 8.1 million darts. Now, this includes stocks and derivatives. But before I go any further over here, Let's assume, and we're just going to take a quick assumption over here, and I'm going to bring up my, my trusty little calculator. 
of the 8.1 million darts, let's assume, okay, that about 30%, across the board, about 30% of those are derivative trades, which are, you know, options and so forth. So you're looking about, uh, oh, 2.43 million option trades uh, a day. And then some of that's going to be futures contracts, but push that aside. And we'll say that the average size in option trades, and again, I have to go off of what I know in the business and I can't give away too much, but let's say the average Okay, size trade is five contracts. So I'll multiply this, okay, by about like five contracts equals, all right. So you're good just with these brokerage firms. You're doing at least, okay. And again, I, I think that these numbers are loose. I think this is like what I call napkin math, right? Back of the napkin math, you're good for at least uh, at least 12 million, okay, option contracts trading a day. This is why it's a retail bubble. Okay, um, what you're looking at over here, as I said a moment ago, you're probably good for a minimum, okay, of 12 million option contracts a day just being retail. Now, again, that doesn't include Robinhood. It doesn't include, you know, uh, Tasty Works and a bunch of other peripheral brokerage firms. But I think that we're comfortable saying that that number is probably well north of 12 million, okay? The total contract volume, and this is, this is just options, total contract volume. For example, this was, I believe, on Wednesday, was 25 million. The point that I'm trying to make is I've actually been looking at these statistics for, uh, for years, years and years. This is the OCC, the, what, Option Clearing Corp contract volume, okay? And when it comes down to it, you start to look at equity options, okay? Slightly outpacing index options, first of all. This, that's a dead giveaway because professionals would much rather go into the index options. It's almost everything is in equity options. If you look at the July average, 28 million option contracts a day. The, um, the 2020, again, year-to-date average is right here, which is about uh, 28 million, pretty similar. But if you look at uh, what, July 19th, this is uh, July of 2019, 18 million. Do you realize, okay, they were now jumped to, to what, 28 million of which, okay, I'm going to say it's probably close to on a, on a day we're doing 28 million contracts over half the size is actually in retail, okay? Which actually means that the entire professional world has actually removed themselves from proprietary trading and they're actually just being reactive to your order flow. This is insane. Let me tell you something about retail. I've been watching retail traders again since roughly 2001 when I got into the brokerage world. Retail trading, okay, typically wouldn't even account for 10% on the option side, okay? The biggest and baddest, okay, would maybe be 30% of all the option contracts. Usually when it comes down to option contracts, you know, it's firms like Goldman Sachs and so forth. This is all retail and we're not even talking about stock here. Okay, we haven't even covered stock. The number of trades coming through, it isn't just alarming, it's downright shocking. Why do you think I just spent the last, you know, 10 minutes taking you through? Retail is absolutely unequivocally a bubble at this point, and that bubble is chasing the marketplace. That bubble is driving the marketplace. And the reason that I wanted to sit down and I really wanted to assess, like, is it really retail trading? Absolutely. It's retail trading that's driving markets right now, which is the scariest thing possible and plausible. Because if we start to go back into a tailspin, okay, this thing, it's going to be what? Completely out of control because retail traders, they barf, okay? And they will barf up positions. The interesting thing though, I also went back and I don't want to spend too much more time on this in this weekend's video, but I also went back and assessed, okay, the growth of these trades, all right? The growth of the trades it didn't really start until the outright crash that occurred. It was like people were literally, let me actually come to the spiders and clean it up here a little bit for you. It was like people have literally been waiting for years for this to occur. And the second that it did, they bought them back up. We are in an extraordinarily dangerous time. By the way, on top of all the retail darts that I just explained, every major brokerage firm has now announced record breaking number of accounts that are opening. We are absolutely again in a retail trading bubble. How far can it go? I don't believe it's probably got uh, too much. All you're going to have to have is a couple of wicked down days when people are going to uh, 
chuck the proverbial cheese and uh, and start to blow out of positions. This thing is going to be downright dangerous. You need to know that. And thinking about it more and more, I'm just going to be all over outlier trades. I mean, I'm trying to you know present this in such a manner that you realize what I'm going to be doing in trading with it. I'm going to be a buyer of premium. I'm going to be buying outliers. Effectively, what that means is when you start looking at things like auto expected moves, you know, we're supposed to move X amount. We're not. OK, when people start to panic, we're going to move much, much further than expected. Why are we going to move further than expected? Simply because retail trade, it's not the markets are not going to be doing a good job of handicapping risk when it's all retail trade in here, because, well, first of all, it's never occurred before. So again, there's a huge amount to think about this. And I'm going to be talking about it throughout the course of this next week here at Theo Trade. Now with that, let's get down to business, talk a little bit about markets, all right? So the rotation game, it's in full swing. It's musical chairs of the markets. And I, I always say this, did you, uh, did you reserve a chair in the musical chairs of the markets? And did you reserve that chair? I will have one hedge, please. You got to understand the rotation game is a big one. So this is this is where I actually see professional traders and it's like the only place I see professional traders and what they're effectively doing when I say like the rotation game, the way to, I guess, emphasize this is to look at something like the expected move. I'm going to start here in the financials and just make a quick point with the financials. Look at the financials. They're actually bid up just a little bit on the week, right? So the financials, yes, they bid up a little bit on the week. And when the rotation game comes into play, then we'll also look at like the NASDAQ. And I'll just make this as clean as possible. What did the NASDAQ do? Well, the NASDAQ actually broke to the upside and then got absolutely crushed end of the week just off the bottom of the expected move. Okay. The rotation game though goes deeper than just, you know, the NASDAQ or the financials. Again, we can go sector to sector and we've been doing that a lot. You'll also note, Okay, the uh, the energy sector has played into this in very large part. So uh, after an early rally in the week, it also faded again. I could talk about the rotation game all day long, but I, I came up with a much better way to explain this. And I, I think that this is this is one that's going to be kind of pivotal because people don't really understand when I say like the rotation game. It basically means just as wild as it sounds, you know. If we're going to sell the NASDAQ, we got to go out and buy something. We can't let this marketplace fall apart. So if we're going to sell the NASDAQ, you know, darn it, we're going to go out there and buy the financials. Okay. And if we're going to sell the financials, then forget it. I'm going to turn around and buy every tech stock I possibly can. I want to see something really, really wild. Okay. And when I say really, really wild, um, and I'll talk about the NASDAQ here in just a moment, but I thought this is a, a great way to emphasize it. Okay. What I'm now going to show you here is a screenshot. Now, time out. This is a screenshot and the screenshot that I'm taking, because I want to show you exactly what it means to be inside of the rotation game. The screenshot that I'm taking okay, was today. It was on July 24th and it was exactly six minutes after the cash open. All right. That's why I took the full screen, took the full screenshot. What I wanted you to see on this particular screenshot is the rotation game in full swing. First and foremost, this is the S&P 100, the advanced decline line. It's almost a pure 50-50. Got it? So it's a pure 50-50. But in this rotation game, look, the NASDAQ is actually down 1.5%. The S&Ps are being dragged under, okay? They're down 0.7%. Oh, oh, check this out right there. You see the XLF? It's actually up on the day, okay? So the XLF was up. The monsters of tech, the big boys of tech, are getting absolutely killed. Ironically, bonds, bonds were down. Okay, volatility did not know what to do. So I want you to remember a couple things. Okay, listen, Nasdaq is down fairly big. Got it. What? The XLF is actually up on the day by 0.3%. Okay, and we got a 50/50 advanced decline line. Fast forward. Fast forward almost exactly like three hours. Not quite. Okay, so I just fast forward here just to uh, 9, 11 and 23 seconds. Look at the advanced decline line. Remember, a moment ago, I showed you a 50, 50 advanced decline line. Now the advanced decline line is becoming <laughs> hideous. And yet the S&Ps have done what? The S&Ps ironically are only three points removed. Okay, but they started buying the NASDAQ. And as soon as they started buying the NASDAQ, they started to sell off the XLF. It's the rotation game, people get with it and by the way when they started actually rotating out out of the financials they started turning around then and buying none other than the bonds over here volatility subsided a little bit how could volatility subside okay 
with an increasing advanced decline line, how does volatility subside, okay, when the S&Ps are only three points higher? Again, this is retail trade. It all is evidence, if you will. You got a bunch of uh, just, you know, it's like wild child in uh, inside of the market over here. But this one, this is crazy. Okay, I mean, this is something for for the ages over here. These are, that's why I took some screenshots in this particular case. This is phenomenal stuff. You just will not see stuff like this very often in this uh, in this particular business. So you got to understand this next week. Okay, this next week is going to be pivotal. I would like to sit here and spend the next hour with you describing everything I think is going to happen in the next week. But the next week is going to come all down to the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's hanging on by a thread right now. The coming week of earnings, okay, could be absolutely derail everything. And you saw some damage. We took some damage. But, you know, some of the big earnings haven't even come out yet. Like the stuff that's going to be interesting is when Facebook releases, okay, when Google comes out, when Apple comes out. Like Microsoft, what did Microsoft do? They beat and the stock got smoked. What did Intel do? They beat and they had product problems and the stock got absolutely annihilated. What did Tesla do? Shocked the world and still ended up at the edge of their expected move. By the way, mind you, I told you, I told you on Wednesday night, the only thing that matters in earnings are the expected moves. And guess what? Tesla sold off, okay? What did it sell off? Well, it was at 1,600, ended up down about 1,400. It was about a $200 expected move on this thing and it moved. 200 bucks. Microsoft is the exact same thing. Microsoft had an expected move. We were expecting it to close right around like the 202 level. Oh, we missed it just by a hair. Okay. I'm telling you though, you can try to handicap this marketplace as much as you want. NASDAQ right now is hanging on by a thread. I personally won't even bother looking at the earnings numbers. It just doesn't matter. You can look at the earnings numbers all you want. All you need to do is look at Apple and look at the expected move. Okay, look at Apple, look at the expected move. It's $20, okay? You're coming into a week with a $20 expected move inside of pretty much, you know, the marquee, you know, $1.6, $1.7 trillion market cap. Be afraid because if this thing rocks, okay, double the expected move, what do you think that's gonna do to the S&Ps? What do you think it's gonna do to the NASDAQ, okay? Somebody's gonna miss this week, but the thing is, you hope that somebody misses big, but then somebody will probably come out and be like, yeah, we're doing wonderful over here. But we're hanging on by a thread. This week's going to be pivotal. The next thing you got to understand, bonds, okay? The bonds, they're scared to do anything, but they actually clipped the 181. And here's the irony. They actually closed the 181. And I told you, if bonds hit 181, fear trade is going to start to come back in, okay? When I say the fear trade is going to come back in, look for it. So this next week, the Fed's coming. Fed is going to be speaking this next week. There is actually a Fed meeting. Most people don't care. Interest rates are zero. Doesn't matter. Okay. It is going to matter though what Jerome Powell says. Doesn't matter that interest rates are zero. Doesn't matter. Okay. You know what you might think about this. The bonds right now look extraordinarily defensive. They've been creeping up. Why are they creeping up? The bonds are creeping up. The dollar's actually been selling off. Okay. S&Ps are getting downright squirrely. The NASDAQ, NASDAQ is throwing off the bidless beast on a day-to-day -day basis over here. You got the makings, again, of a lot of volatility. The whole question is, is the marketplace going to take the bait and run with it? Okay. The Fed, I don't think the Fed wants to say anything right now. Okay. I, I think literally they want to be, you know, they want to be punks to Tony Phil. If they see their shadow, they're going to turn and run. All right, next in the docket here, and we'll, we'll again, we'll talk a little bit more about the Fed on uh, on Monday, Monday night's video. Next week, uh, sorry, next week, uh, three weeks inside the expected move. So uh, three weeks inside the expected move. Take a quick, uh, quick gander here at the expected moves inside of the SPX. The SPX is the mother of all products. You got one, you got two, you got three weeks inside the expected move. Why, okay, do I even bother mentioning this? Oh, well, you should probably be, uh, you should be afraid and you should be buying some premium because there haven't been too many periods like in here. Look, we had one, two, three, four. This one barely made it, maybe five. Uh, we'll call it like six weeks. This one though is, that's that's questionable best, okay? It's five, six weeks inside the expected move. Mark time, you're three weeks inside the expected move. And here's the interesting, the most interesting thing about these three, these last three weeks. These last three weeks, we never tagged the upside or the downside of the expected move at all in the last three weeks. Highly, highly improbable. This next week, forget about the Fed, just get ready to rumble. 
get ready to rumble. By the way, speaking of get ready to rumble, this last week we had a $74 expected move. What are we uh, looking at this next week? Well, ask the SPX again. I actually started recording this before the market's place even closed. So let's actually refer to the SPX. What's the expected move going to be? Almost the same as last week. You're looking at about uh, 76 dollars and 79 cents so 76.79 looks like the expected move for the week and uh, i fully anticipate that we're going to tag or even exceed that at portions of the week again hanging on by the thread let this marketplace i'd love to sit here and dictate to you all the wonderful things the market threw off throw it all out the window right now okay you know that the risk is on the table right now you see it in the nasdaq but you've got some big earnings and this particular earnings season the marketplace as a whole is paying attention. Mind you, there's some good numbers that got thrown out. We still got tagged. Amazon, ooh, I don't care who you are. That is going to hurt coming into uh, later in the week. You have all the mega market caps. Okay, How many trillions of market caps do you need to, to have a clue? Well, guess what? Get a clue. Because again, NASDAQ's holding on by a thread. And the NASDAQ unto itself, there isn't a feel for it. Okay. Order flow dictates everything. And what are we seeing inside of the NASDAQ? I mean, look at Amazon for a second. Even Amazon's turning into the bidless beast. The NASDAQ, it's just downright wild. Okay. They're buying it right up until the point they sold it. With that, it's a lot to think about. Okay. Spend a little time. Look at some of the retail trading numbers out there. Uh, again, one of the reasons that you're looking at this marketplace and probably thinking to yourself every single day, right? Everybody thinks this every single day. The whole summation of this, you look at this marketplace and you look, that's just ridiculous. There's more horrible news coming out every single day. Okay. We're back into it with China. There's a pandemic going on. We're not even in a recession anymore. People are starting to call it a depression. The, gay, the initial jobless claims are horrific. It just goes on and on. The list of things. Market does not care. Want to know why? Okay. His mom and pop are sitting at home quarantined, slinging five lots of contracts out there and hedging with some stock. Okay. People, it is on right now. Retail is just as crazy as it sounds. And that's why it's actually going to drive a lot of uncertainty and a hell of a lot of volatility, not just this summer. Okay. This marketplace is owned now by retail. And uh, I don't know about you, but I like it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.